Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to our first Coffee with the Collection. Uh, my name is Amanda. I'm the Director of Learning and Engagement at the Fred Jones Jr. Museum of Art. Um, I hope you all have with you a lovely cup of coffee today. Um, we're going to hear from our presenter who is uh, Dr. Hadley German. She's the curator at the museum. Um, so Hadley, without further ado, I'm going to hand it on over to you. Thank you and welcome everybody. I'm going to share my screen. So pardon me while I do that. Okay. Well, welcome to our first ever Coffee with the Collection. It is my pleasure this morning to introduce you to a recent addition to the museum's collection, Emil Bistrom's Penetration. The museum purchased this painting in 2018, and it was installed last October as part of our museum-wide reinstallation. It's on view right now, and I'd encourage all of you to take a, uh, take a moment and see it the next time you visit the museum. But before we get started, I want to take a little bit of time and invite you to pull up the chat box on your Zoom window. Um, so you're going, going to click on the more button at the top of your page or the chat icon and then type in one or two word descriptions into that box of this painting. You can talk about the colors, you can talk about the composition, but try to only use one or two words uh, to describe it. So let's take a look and see. Uh, majestic, calm colors, uh, colorful, uh, geometric, um, melancholy, that's a great one. Precise, this is great too. Um, so I'll, <laughs> I'll let you all continue typing in um, your descriptions of this painting. And I, I have to say the very things that you're identifying, uh, mysterious, yeah, that's another good one are things that I find appealing about this work. It's colorful, it's geometric, it's abstract, it is mysterious. Um, it's simultaneously hard-edged and soft-hued. It contains seemingly simple geometric forms, but they're arranged in a complex structure. The circles and trapezoids and rectangles are all familiar to us, but they appear mysterious in this organization. And if we were gonna summarize the underlying message of Bistrom's painting, we might say with the artist that it attempts to create order and harmony out of chaos. So I'll give you um, a detail so you can see. Um, painted in 1936 in the Great Depression and on the brink of World War II, it's a painting in a way that is about creating order in the middle of a chaotic world situation. Now, Emil Bistrom viewed art's purpose as creating order out of chaos, and the same might be true of how art affected his life in general. Okay. He came of age as a poor Hungarian immigrant on the Lower East Side who earned a reputation as battling Bennett, a street fighter and a gang leader and a really exceptional boxer. Commercial art formed his escape uh, from, from boxing, and he really kind of sought an escape from boxing through art. In fact, he argued art had redemptive qualities, and it was certainly um, the case for, for him. As he says here, by art and art alone, we are lifted up into the world of ideas and ideals of beauty. Now, in the 1920s, he took um, he took art classes at the National Academy of Design in the evening, the Art Students League, and also Cooper Union. He studied with such people as Howard Giles, Jay Hambridge, and Nicholas Rorick. And his passion for learning ultimately led to his becoming an influential art teacher in New York and then later in the Southwest. Uh, order out of chaos indeed. Okay, now Bistrom's idea of creating order from chaos through art is expressed uh, through, through the compositional structure he employed. And by the early 1920s, he had devoted himself to a compositional approach called dynamic symmetry. This is a method of breaking down the composition into squares and rectangles. Um, it was proposed by Jay Hambridge, uh, a Harvard professor, and based on Euclidean geometry. So it's based on the golden ratio 
of three to two. So basically, the composition is structured around a series of squares, so three squares tall by two squares wide. Um, now, Hambridge theorized that classical architecture followed these proportions, um, and one could achieve total harmony in design by mimicking these proportions in their artwork. This theory was highly influential on artists. Um, and in the 1920s, Bistrom had basically adopted dynamic symmetry as his kind of underlying approach to all of his compositions. But he was also developing an interest in the occult, including theosophy, which is a spiritual system that, um, that draws on Buddhist and, and Hindu beliefs. Now, Bistrom's philosophy merged science, mathematics, um, and occult ideas, really becoming something of a precursor to what we might consider New Age thinking. Um, he believed that artists could access ideas, um, or ideas resided on another kind of uh, mental plane, and you would have to go there through meditation to kind of to, um, to find or to, to acquire ideas and then bring them back to this plane of existence. So convinced of the power of mathematics and geometry was Bistrom that he changed his name in the late 1920s um, from Bistran, B-I-S-T-R-A-N, to Bistram, B-I-S-T-T-R-A-M, at the urging of a numerologist. His wife Mary also changed her name from Ma Mary to Marion, M-A-Y-R-I-O-N, at the urging of the same numerologist. Um, and you can see the effect here in his signature on our painting on, on penetration. So he revised uh, the spelling from a single T and an N to a double T and an M, essentially allowing him to insert the pi symbol into the middle of his name. So he doesn't write two separate T's, he's joined those T's together into a, to a one symbol. And not only that, it also allows his name to be symmetrical, rotating around um, that double T in the middle. Now, the pi symbol in theosophy actually represents the relationship between the creator and the creative power of the individual. And so, uh, Bistrom is able, by inserting this symbol into his name, um, to, to really insert his philosophy into his signature on every canvas. It's demonstrating his dedication to geometry in his own signature on each painting. Now, Bistrom, like so many New York artists uh, before him, ventured to New Mexico in 1930, and he was really seeking an escape from the chaos of, of, of New York following the stock market crash. So he first visits Taos in 1930, and he only stays three months. He was impressed by the landscape, but also frustrated by it. He wrote, whenever I tried to paint, uh, whenever I tried to paint what was before me, I was frustrated by the grandeur of the scenery and the limitless space. Above all, a strange, almost mystic quality of light. You kind of see that mystic light in this painting of Eagle's Nest Lake, uh, painted that year and now in the collection of the Vero Beach Art Museum. Now, um, his visit to Taos only lasts three months. He goes back to New York. Um, and then in 1931, he spends the year on a Guggenheim Fellowship in Mexico studying with Diego Rivera, the great muralist. And you would think, oh, maybe he's not going to go back to Taos if he kind of found it frustrating. But um, I guess it wasn't totally frustrating because in 1932, he returns to Taos and he opens an art school, the, the Taos School of Art. Um, and while there, in the 1930s, he continues to paint representational canvases, which, which really reflect the influence of Diego Rivera, like the portrait at the left. He's painting murals for the WPA in New Mexico, Texas, and also Washington, D.C., uh, like the, the mural that you see at the right. This was painted for the Roswell, New Mexico Post Office, although now it's, um, it's in Albuquerque today. And his work 
during the 1930s becomes increasingly abstract, even as he continues to produce these uh, very representational scenes, including um, depictions of pueblos and the landscape. Um, but you might think, this doesn't look like the work of the same artist. How, I mean, how can we reconcile Bistrom's really abstract penetration painted in 1936 with this mural painted the very same year? Well, Bistrom himself said that the unifying factor um, in all of his work throughout his career, regardless of the style, was its adherence to dynamic symmetry. And sure enough, if you look at the mural on the right, um, if you dropped a line right down the middle through that sword, it's a symmetrical composition, right? It's unfolding on both sides around that, that sword. And even the portrait on the left, if you dropped a vertical line down the, the middle of that portrait, it's gonna cross right between um, those buttons on Rosario's uh, shirt. And the composition, you know, it unfolds um, basically symmetrically on either side. So dynamic symmetry is in fact the unit unifying factor across his work in, in various styles, which brings us back to our painting, to penetration. So what is this painting about? Well, Bistrom, Bistrom's work is intentionally open-ended, his abstract work. He encouraged his viewers um, to use their imagination and see what they could make of the work. So it's less about any one specific meaning than what the viewer brings to the piece individually. And as an example of his transcendent paintings or transcendental paintings, the title here, Penetration, refers to this idea of accessing higher mental planes, of accessing ideas through meditation. Um, in fact, the way that he would create canvases like this um, was to first kind of become totally relaxed and to meditate on a certain idea. So in this case, he's meditating on the idea of penetration and he would allow himself to, he would allow geometric shapes um, and lines and colors to kind of filter through his consciousness and arrange themselves in compositions. And then after he kind of came out of the meditative a state he would he would write these furious notes on on what he had experienced and the compositions he had seen these arrangements of shapes and then that would um, he would refine over time and then that would ultimately become the kind of finished painting okay so he sought to create beauty, beautiful designs that merged um, color form and composition into something that could transcend mere representation and symbolically depict a higher consciousness. Furthermore, Bistrom claimed art should not concern itself with imitation, that is imitation of the natural world, um, but with creation. It should be, in a sense, have this kind of creative spark of its own. Well, this brings me to the elephant in the room. So everybody take, take a drink of coffee, a swig of coffee. And we're gonna talk a little, <laughs> we're gonna talk a little bit about sex. Um, Bistrom regularly used terms and forms related to sex as a metaphor for artistic creation. So this is evident in his writing. Um, it's evident in the title and the vertical phallic forms in this particular composition. And it's, it's evident perhaps more overtly or most overtly in his multiple variations of the Oversoul um, painted in 1938. And then there were um, variations of this composition that he reproduced over time. Um, he, he described um, creative forces on the far left as representing the seven creative spirits or seven creative forces fecunding the cosmic egg. He, he described the oversoul, the painting as center, and the variation at right as, as uh, depicting the merging or the oneness of man's baser and higher um, natures. And Bistrom and Marion held some interesting ideas about sex. They viewed art making, in a sense, as um, an expression of sexual energy, of procreation, um, and they experimented with celibacy. As Marion once wrote to a friend, um, 
the creation of great art, art that she said contained a quote unquote dynamic force. And a dynamic force is what, what uh, Bistrom was seeking to imbue his abstractions with. Okay, art that contained this dy dynamic force required celibacy. Otherwise, as she put it, quote, the dynamic force expended elsewhere no longer um, is available on demand, end quote. Okay, now that said, it would be a mistake to say that our painting is merely about or purely about penetration in a sexual sense. Uh, so for Bistrom in 1936, the composition even more so implied mental penetration, transcendence even, a solution to an aesthetic problem. So I remind you, he said, we must paint not, uh, not what we see, but what we think, okay? Creating order and unity out of the variety and disorder of life. Now, in 1937 and 38, so just after he paints this painting, uh, Bistrom was developing a new course for the Taos Art School. And um, he wrote a 70 page document basically outlining what he considered the problems and abstraction that he wanted his students to address. And he tasked his students to create designs that visually through um, geometric abstraction expressed such problems as strange forms in space. A lot of, the, a lot of these problems were musical in nature. So Allegro um, was one, um, Dante was another, and penetration was another one, another one of these problems that he wanted uh, his students to express through abstraction. So students would make black and white studies in the morning, and then in the afternoon they would make color studies um, exploring, you know, the, these topics. So Bistrom himself also explored the same concepts he was teaching. He made more than a hundred color, color, uh, color and design studies between 1937 and 1942 um, that were kind of following along these same, this process he had his students engaged in, and many of those um, are now in the Anschutz collection in Denver. So in other words, penetration, our, our painting, is Bistrom's attempt to solve his own problem. How do you express abstractly this concept of penetration? How do you do that um, through geometric forms? Now, in Bistrom's lifetime, he was well known in the Southwest as a muralist, and especially for his art school. Apparently, he taught dynamic symmetry to all of the Taos and Santa Fe artists, um, as his wife put it, although she said not many of them um, cared to admit that. He, he also taught uh, dynamic symmetry to such Western painters as Maynard Dixon, um, and dynamic symmetry is something that characterizes the, um, um, really, the, the kind of great paintings Dixon painted in the 1930s of both the landscape and of of um, Forgotten Men, the Forgotten Man series um, of the 30s. But Bistrom is perhaps best known today as a co-founder of the Transcendental Painting Group, or the TPG, which he founded in Taos two years after painting Penetration. So in 1938, uh, the TPG is oftentimes um, described as having its first meeting in June in Santa Fe of 1938, but it actually, the group was um, founded in Bistrom's studio earlier that year. He co-founded it with Raymond Johnson, who was a faculty member at the University of New Mexico and several of their students. And the group sought to, let me change my slide. See, they sought to carry painting beyond the appearance of the physical world through new concepts of space, color, light, and design to imaginative worlds that are idealistic and spiritual. So that's from their manifesto uh, composed in 1938. And this marked the first official challenge to traditional representational painting by members of the Taos and Santa Fe art colonies. And these paintings were largely at the time unsaleable. So Bistrom continued to have to make representational work that he could sell while he was dedicated to this kind of um, painting. 
Now, the TPG basically adopted Bistrom's ideas and viewed transcendental painting as an antidote, as Alfred Morin, um, the writer of the group, described it, an antidote to the chaos of the Great Depression and World War II. So in other words, Bistrom and the TPG together viewed painting as a creative force that could positively transcend or offer constant renewal amid um, the world situation. And the group adopted dynamic symmetry at, at Bistrom's insistence as the compositional structure that kind of under, underlined their work. They exhibited together only a few times before um, dissolving in 1942, most notably at the Guggenheim in 1940. And the TPG, you know, is rather short-lived and it was overshadowed, um, soon overshadowed by post-war modernism um, on both coasts, on the East and West Coast. And it only recently has started receiving um, the attention it really deserves. There was a fantastic Agnes Pelton exhibition last year that traveled to Santa Fe. And I, I have it on a uh, good word that there's going to be a, a Bistrom ex exhibition um, traveling from California to um, Albuquerque and then to, to the Philbrook here in Oklahoma, either next year or the year after. I'm not quite sure of the date. Now, in conclusion, in 1941, Bistrom wrote of his non-objective works like, like Penetration, that while they have been, while they may have been successful as pattern or color harmonies, I remain unsatisfied. He felt they lacked the vital significance or that life force that true art, in his view, had to possess. He, he, and I think despite his dissatisfaction with these paintings at that time period, we can recognize his contribution to modernist abstraction and these paintings as significant in their own right, you know, despite what, you know, as an artist, he felt you know, they were incomplete. They didn't quite get at what he, he saw. And we can definitely recognize the significance of this particular painting, both in Bistrom's oeuvre and for the museum. So I'm going to show you a little clip um, how you can find the painting in our collection. Let's see if I can. So although we have an outstanding collection of, of work by Towson Santa Fe painters of the 1920s and 1910s, we previously had no great paintings of, um, belonging to the Transcendental Painting Group and no Bistrums in the collection at all until acquiring this work in 2018. And I think given the unsettling moment we now find ourselves in in history, this is a painting whose color harmonies and idealism of the notion of rising above the physical realm or beyond the physical realm can resonate with viewers today. It was painted by an artist seeking to create harmony and order in a period not unlike ours, a period likewise plagued by economic uncertainty, environmental chaos, and international strife. And I would, I'm going to stop sharing my screen but I would uh, recommend all of you take a minute to see this painting the next time you're in the museum and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Hadley, that was amazing. Um, I have a question for you. Okay. Um, can you tell me how did we acquire this painting? Um, you know, was it gifted to us? Uh, how did we go about, how did you end up acquiring it? Um, so it was actually a museum purchase in 2018 and I just got the Shannon's auction catalog. Um, it's probably been sitting on my desk, well, since earlier in September. It was in a Shannon's auction in, in, um, in spring of 2018, and we had been looking for, or we had been on um, the lookout for, I should say, an example of TPG painting, since there was really a gap in the collection in those regards. Um, and when this painting was offered for sale, it's such a fantastic example of Bistrom's work that we felt like we had, you know, we had no choice, we had to participate in the auction. And then we were fortunate, en fortunate enough to get it. Um, does that answer your question? I guess I will add, I was, I was the person on the phone bidding <laughs> for this painting, and that was probably the most exciting two minutes of my life. 
Oh my gosh, I can imagine it was. Well, I'm, I hope you get to do that again and have a exciting two minutes <laughs> in your near future. Um, no, thank you. That's really interesting to, to hear about. Sometimes I think we don't always, you know, understand exactly how some of these pieces come into our um, I would add, if anybody has a great, I miss Pelton, um, please, and you're willing to part with it, I think, you know, it would be great to have an example of her work as well. Oh, definitely, for sure. Um, well, I just want to thank you so much, Hadley, for presenting this wonderful information to us today. Um, and thank you, everyone, for joining and listening in. Um, I do want to go ahead and invite everyone. So our next Coffee with the Collection will take place on Friday, October 23rd at 9.30 in the morning. Um, and our presenter for that will be Byron Price. So he is the interim director of the museum right now. Um, and he will be talking about the Bronco Buster by Frederick Remington. I'm really excited to hear everything that he has to say. And I just also want to let everyone know that we have an exciting new partnership that we just uh, put together recently that will take effect um, for our October um, session. And that is with the Black Camel Coffee, which is a local coffee roaster here in Norman. Um, and there will be more information about that on the registration page and our website. So um, please look for that on our website. Thank you very much, everyone.